Hello, welcome back to the uh, Bloomberg Invest Global Conference and uh, thanks to uh, our colleagues at Bloomberg Intelligence. I'm joined now by Carmen Reinhardt, the uh, recently appointed Chief Economist at the World Bank. Uh, of course, a uh, teacher of international finance at, Harvard, at Kennedy School at Harvard and most most famous for being the co-author of This Time is Different, the uh, best-selling book on a uh, financial crisis. Uh, welcome, Carmen. Thank you. I'd like to start with the cliched question, of course, is this time different? And if so, what is the World Bank uh, trying to achieve in, in getting the world back on track? Well, so two very different questions. Uh, is this time different? I think, Simon, uh, we've spoken before. You know that uh, um, since fairly early in the process, I've been highlighting the point that this indeed is different. This didn't originate uh, in a financial excess in the 2008, 2009, and other varieties, but uh, it has morphed into uh, a major crisis. And one of the things that uh, I've highlighted that is very different is that the policy response, the, the lockdowns, the distancing, uh, the suspension of global travel of any shape or form um, is a very novel response to pandemics. Pandemics are old. Um, I've likened the, uh, and this is relevant to the World Bank response, I've likened the uh, crisis more to the 30s than to the global financial crisis of 2008-2009. And the reason for likening it more to the 30s, despite the fact that the macro policy response across countries has been very different from what we saw in the 30s, but the reason uh, for making it more akin to the 30s is that this is truly a global financial crisis. 2008, 2009 was a crisis, a banking financial crisis in 11 advanced economies. The emerging markets were hit in 2008, 2009, uh, but rebounded very sharply. China was growing double digits. Commodity markets were very strong. Uh, and this time, of course, if the advanced economies are seeing problems, it actually pales in comparison to some of the problems and challenges that the developing countries and emerging markets are seeing because they don't have safety nets because they don't have the fiscal space uh, to try to counter uh, the effects of the lockdowns. Uh, and so, you know, the, the issue of how do you support uh, countries in which revenue has collapsed, uh, if you rely on tourism, tourism has collapsed. If you rely on commodities, commodity price exports and volumes are down. So uh, the, World Bank and the IMF, the multilateral community in general, has been engaged in record lending, both in terms of the volume of lending and in terms of the number of countries um, that have accessed uh, that lending. And one very important feature that distinguishes uh, this lending wave, if you will, by the multilaterals, by the World Bank, by the IMF, is the speed uh, with which uh it has been decided on moved upon and uh reached uh you know reached their destinations for countries to be enabled uh to to counter all the 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 very many uh dimensions of the adverse shock they're facing because as i said this uh you know this crisis the manifestations uh, it has taken, it's not just a health crisis in some regions and some areas of sub-Saharan Africa, you're also facing food uh, crisis uh, situations in cases in the Caribbean in which uh, you have a overwhelming dependency on tourism. The, 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 the situation is very different, but nonetheless very acute. So there's a diversity uh, of very serious problems. And so uh, the response is up to the moment has been based on providing the speediest 
uh, relief. And what more can be done now that speedy relief has been put in place? What more can be done? Well, uh, on May 1st, uh, the G20 also agreed to uh, an initiative uh, that uh, would suspend uh, debt servicing uh, for the poorest countries, the IDA countries. And uh, the kind of savings potentially uh, would be uh, freed up resources, that resources that were being used uh, to service the debt, to be used to uh, support, uh, you know, the the support the anti-COVID uh, response, and uh, so far um, the participation has been uh, predominantly an official one. Uh, that is to say, despite very early efforts. And, and our president, David Malpass, has been making, uh, uh, you know, repeated, uh, uh, repeated rounds to get the private sector on board. Uh, so far, the participation on the um, suspension, temporary suspension of, of debt servicing has been limited to the uh, official creditors, but what more can be done? I think an important one is also uh, some debt relief uh, from the private creditors, which has yet uh, not been uh, forthcoming. Now, beyond that, uh, what can be done um, is is complicated, right? Because you know what we've seen in in the U.S., what we've seen in Europe and, and, and in uh, some of the major central banks is undertake, you know, unprecedented uh, policy actions uh, to provide liquidity, to provide support uh, to banks uh, that have loans that have been compromised by the output collapse and the surge in unemployment to provide support to high yield corporates. Uh, well, you know, the international community doesn't have that kind of firepower. Uh, you know, the, the IMF or the World Bank uh, have that kind, can't print dollars. You can't, you don't have the, uh, the ability to, to act as forcefully as we've seen in the Federal Reserve. So uh, I think going forward, revisiting uh, the issue of expanding uh, the capacity of multilaterals to continue to provide assistance, especially in a scenario where uh, the COVID uh, pandemic is not dealt with more definitively, i.e. a vaccine, a vaccine that is widely accessible uh, globally. Uh, in that eventuality, you know, that, that's, that's an issue that, that's ahead of us. And what's at stake here if the private sector doesn't join the uh, the relief efforts that uh, the uh, the sovereign sector has? Is is there a, is that a challenge to the uh, the, the recovery eventually? Uh, so uh, many things are at stake. Uh, there is the issue uh, that again, in the midst of what can be safely described as the worst uh, uh, global crisis we've had in uh, at least, at least, uh, you know, uh, almost a century, almost a century, um, that in that kind of environment, um, countries uh, are torn uh, or between uh, diverting resources to debt servicing versus, you know, using the resources to, um, support social safety, uh, both in the medical front and also support lost incomes. Um, so there, there's that enormous uh, tension, uh, but there's also the, the uh, more lasting effects that uh, if the uh, uh, impact of the pandemic 
is made deeper by not having resources to cope with it, the scars and lasting damage done to countries facing that situation um, is that much deeper and longer. Uh, so, so basically, what we're saying is, you know, the 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 this, in my my view, and I think markets are a little certainly more up, have a more optimistic or upbeat tick than than I do. Um, this this is not. I think there's a real danger of confusing um, rebound with recovery. That we're we're seeing a lot of things rebound. And that's taken as a sign that we're on the path to recovery. I think true recovery means you're at least as well off as you were before uh, the uh, the crisis started. And I think we uh, are a long way off that in the U.S. and even much more so uh, in the developing world in varying degrees. There's a lot of heterogeneity when one talks about the developing world. Um, but importantly, what I'm what I'm saying is, lack of uh, resources now, whether it's coming from, uh, um, you know, in the form of of, of uh, uh, suspending temporarily suspending uh, debt service, or whether it's coming from access to new lending, uh, lack of resources now uh, could mean that the impacts uh, of COVID are much longer lived, that the recovery is weaker, it takes longer. And therefore, um, you know, I think it is, it would be wise over the long haul for investors to take into account uh, that, uh, you know, how long the damage lasts, how deep it is, uh, also importantly, uh, is affected by the tools they have on hand, uh, these countries have on hand today. And what role of China? China obviously plays an outsized role in, in this than it did in, in previous decades. How important is it that China um, carries through on the, it, as a member of the G20? How confident are you that it will carry through on its commitments there and perhaps elsewhere um, uh, on the debt relief front? Uh, it's extremely important. Um, it's extremely important because um, if you look at the last 20 years, I mean, uh, the China's spectacular rise in global trade is well known, well documented. But I think one area that has received far less attention is that over the last 20 years, uh, China became the biggest uh, lender uh to developing countries especially in the low income spectrum um and so china is the is a bigger creditor than the rest of the g19 combined uh so if you don't get china on board in a, a, a debt um uh, in in dssi in the uh, suspension of payments um the relief uh, would be uh, infinitely smaller, would be, uh, you know, of much more limited, uh, of much more limited scope. To date, uh, you know, the signaling and the uh, movement has been towards having truly a G20 uh, initiative, that is, uh, participation of the G20 governments. Uh, so one scenario that one, G, you know, the other G19 countries would want to avoid is we're giving, uh, we're, we're um, providing debt forgiveness and the, but it's idea that it's debt forgiveness to be used for uh, managing the crisis rather than for servicing uh, either the debt of China or the debt of the private sector. Uh, neither of those uh, alternatives are, are certainly uh, what was in the minds of, of the policymakers um, when they sat around and decided, let's, let's, let's provide some debt relief. You don't want it, you want it to have Im impact towards the, the goals uh, of crisis management. 
What is your overall forecast for the world economy now? Uh, now you've inherited this uh, this great job. Just be, before you joined, uh, the uh, the World Bank was uh, predicting a, a global contraction of 5.2 percent uh, uh, this year, the worst uh, performance in emerging markets and developing nations since 1960. Is the are the seeds being planted for a, a fuller recovery, or are you concerned that uh, that we're going to see a drawn out uh, uh, period of very sluggish growth worldwide? So, first of all, I think one, one thing we have to have very, very clear is the degree of uncertainty that surrounds any point estimate on anything. I mean, earlier this year, the World Trade Organization came out and said, during 2020, uh, global world trade would decline anywhere between 13% and 32%. That's a rather broad band. Uh, and I think it's very indicative, this is not a criticism of them, it's very indicative of the degree of uncertainty uh, that we have at the moment. And the degree of uncertainty is that very much of what we're seeing in economic activity is driven by something, i.e. the path of, of, of COVID, uh, of which uh, our capacity to uh, predict whether the first wave will take very long to overcome. Certainly in the US, the, the persistence of the first wave has is, is, is been significant. Secondly, how, how that first wave circles the globe, it hasn't done so synchronously. We've seen the later outbreaks migrating to emerging markets like Brazil, like Russia, like India, uh, third, we're not really sure whether we're going to get a uh, second wave. Uh, we hope that the appropriate comparison is, of course, not the 1918 influenza, which in fact uh, started in March of 1918, but lasted until 1920, and in effect had three waves, with the second wave being the deadliest of the three. Uh, so what I'm getting at is that um, the degree of uncertainty in any economic forecast at the moment, especially if you try to figure out what, what next year uh, looks like, uh, is I think higher than I've ever seen it in my professional life. Um, I am very uh, skeptical, as I said, of a V shape. Now, a lot of things, including GDP growth, will look like V shapes. Uh, but if you look at individuals' incomes, per capita income, I don't think you're going to get anything like a V shape uh, to that. I think it will take us some years. Uh, to get back to our pre-crisis level of income. In work that I did with Ken Rogoff, uh, looking at the worst crises, uh, and I say crises because they did not involve pandemics, but they involved the combination of, of, of banking, currency, debt crises. Uh, getting out of those uh, debt crises and getting back to the pre-crisis level of income uh, on average, took about eight years. So, you know, that's uh, perhaps uh, we can do better. Um, and the US, for example, uh, given its capacity um, to respond, it's, it's, it has, as it has, as it continues uh, to do, I think the capacity to respond on the monetary and fiscal is not easy to replicate in other countries, that the damage indeed will be uh, with us for some time. So this is a long-winded way of saying that um, even as the indicators snap back, don't confuse rebound with recovery. Uh, I don't think the recovery is going to be uh, forthcoming over the very near term. Uh, one one question from the audience: How will COVID nineteen affect the terms for emerging market countries to refinance their maturing commercial sovereign debt over the short to medium term? Okay, that's an excellent question. Uh, let me say that uh, one of the striking 
uh, features is after, of course, you know, the, the, the panic in March and so on, uh, when, when the liquidity crunch hit the hardest and, and the big element of surprise was very much with us, uh, you know, um, emerging markets uh, saw a, a reversal in capital flows. Um, in, in a matter of four weeks, uh, in a matter of four weeks, around the late late March, they saw a reversal in capital flows, in which in the 2008-2009 crisis had taken a year uh, to unwind. Um, so, I think one element, and, but we're not there now because you know the the, the very uh, significant uh, provision of liquidity by the Federal Reserve has uh you know change the landscape for 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 debt issuance for emerging markets um i think what is helping emerging markets at the moment uh is as again once again we move into zero interest rates uh the search for yield is is all usually alive and well however um i think one has to keep in mind that the longer the economic downturn uh, lasts, I think the uh, willingness on the part of investors to take more risk uh, on the emerging market side will be mitigated by two factors. Uh, emerging markets, unlike corporates, don't have a support network in the terms of a facility uh, by the Federal Reserve that uh, purchases um, corporates. There is no such facility for purchases of EM debt. Uh, so that network of support is not there. Secondly, uh, the longer uh, this crisis lasts, the more of the real balance sheet damage that we will see in emerging markets, uh, you know, with uh, debt ratios looking worse, uh, with uh, government revenues impacted for a longer haul, and the synthesis of this, uh, we've seen already a record number of sovereign credit rating downgrades. Uh, and so, to make a long story short, I think that while, you know, the ample liquidity, the low rate environment, you know, continues to provide EMs with, you know, the lure of, 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 of high coupons, I, I think if as the crisis, uh, as the recovery uh, process gets delayed, I think uh the risk considerations uh are worsening uh for emerging markets as a class i think you know one has to of course there's enormous degree of differentiation we can't really you know this is a generalization but i think as i said the issue of the you know worsening credit ratings uh uh debt ratios drifting higher uh um revenue shortfalls and what are likely to be other forms of domestic uh, uh, financial fragilities emerging, I think, I think EMs are going to be in a very, very tough spot um, going forward. Casting uh, the net a bit wider to, uh, to fiscal issues, um, you said recently in, in, a, in a newspaper interview that um, you were a fiscal conservative, but now wasn't the time to uh, to worry about that. Talk me through that. How how long does that period get to run, and when do people start? When do fiscal conservatives start to worry about some of the debts that have been run up? Uh, look, I think uh, I likened very much the current situation to a wartime situation. Um, during a war, uh, 
when you go into war, you don't know if the war will last one year, two years, or five years. Um, but certainly, while the war is raging, uh, priority-wise, uh, the concern is about winning the war rather than uh, making very prudent uh, decisions about that. And this situation, unfortunately, uh, has thrown the global economy in a situation that is very similar uh, to a war because, you know, um, issues of trying to uh, jumpstart the economy prematurely uh, can backfire if indeed uh, we still have a COVID problem circulating or if we have a second wave. And this is the point that I tried to highlight early on when you asked me about the forecasts. And I said the key driver or the a, a, a distinguishing feature, any forecast always has standard errors, but the dispersion, uh, the uncertainty uh, that we're facing now is very exceptional. And so uh, as regards going back to the fiscal issue, um, I can't tell you whether, oh, we're going to start worrying about that if we hit, uh, you know, March of next year. And so March of next year is when we start worrying. I, I can't say that because this is really about, um, uh, you know, winning the war first, which we haven't done yet. Common Reinhardt, thank you so much for your time uh, today. Um, good luck with your new appointment at the World Bank.